Today in the Daily Dose, the Battle of Fredericksburg. After Union Army Commander George B. McClellan failed to pursue Robert E. Lee's retreating forces at the Battle of Antietam, President Abraham Lincoln removed McClellan from command, replacing him with Ambrose Burnside on November 7, 1862, with orders from Lincoln to advance on the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia. A week later, Burnside had advanced two Union Corps to Falmouth across the Rappahannock River from Fredericksburg, Virginia, prompting Lee to rush his 80,000-man army to the hills above the city, digging high ground fortifications along a three-mile line of defense before the bulk of Burnside's forces could arrive. Burnside's 120,000-man army found the waters of the Rappahannock too deep to ford, adding a lengthy and mismanaged delay during the construction of pontoon bridges across the river. Lee offered only token resistance at first, preferring to wait for Stonewall Jackson's men to reach Fredericksburg. On December 13th, Burnside ordered General William B. Franklin to lead his left flank on Lee's right, now commanded by Jackson while the remainder of Burnside's forces attempted to assault Confederate General James Longstreet's 1st Corps at Mary's Heights. As the bloodbath ensued, Union General George Meade managed to pierce Jackson's line, but when Franklin botched an opportunity to move his 50,000-man force against the bulge in the Confederate line, by the time the battle ended in defeat for Union forces, the Army of the Potomac had suffered 13,000 casualties, compared to 5,000 on the Confederate side. The crushing defeat sent Union morale into a plummeting freefall, while victory for the Confederates pumped new life into the South after Lee's failure at Antietam. While Burnside took ownership for the Union loss, many in Washington blamed Lincoln for pressuring his commander into an odds-off offensive prompting a majority of Republican senators to call for the reorganization of Lincoln's cabinet, in particular, the removal of Secretary of State William Seward and Secretary of Treasury Salmon Chase. Refusing to bow to congressional pressure, on January 26, 1863, Lincoln asked for Burnside's resignation, replacing him with General Joseph Hooker as commander of the Union Army. Fighting Joe Hooker Cleans House After the Union Army of the Potomac suffered a staggering 12,653 casualties during their defeat at the Battle of Fredericksburg, Army morale plummeted as desertion skyrocketed, reaching 200 per day at its peak, leading one soldier to write that the Army was fast approaching a mob. Adding to an already rock-bottom morale crisis, on January 20, 1862, Potomac Army Commander Major General Ambrose E. Burnside ordered a flanking maneuver on the Confederates' Army of Northern Virginia against their encampment along the Rappahannock River. Now known as Burnside's infamous Mud March, a two-day deluge turned roads into impassable quagmires, stalling wagons and artillery pieces before the Union Army's dispirited retreat to their encampments at Falmouth, leading some historians to equate the early winter misery at Falmouth as the Civil War's equivalent to Valley Forge. After Burnside was replaced by 48-year-old Major General Joseph Hooker, nicknamed Fighting Joe, conditions and morale in the camps soon underwent a staggering turnaround. And while history would paint Fighting Joe as an arrogant, alcoholic womanizer. Three months before his bloody defeat at Chancellorsville, Hooker's organizational talents quickly improved conditions in the camps. Food was his first priority, ordering that his men receive fresh vegetables twice a week and dried legumes once a week. Camp bakeries were erected, providing soldiers with fresh bread four times a week, while sanitation improvements turned camps from indescribably foul to something far more livable. Hooker ordered his men to bury their garbage every day, 
dig drainage ditches around every cabin, and move latrines far from company streets. By April of 1863, proof of Hooker's improvements became evident in reports filed by medical director Major Jonathan Letterman, revealing a 32% drop in potentially fatal diarrhea, a 28% drop in typhoid fever, and the near elimination of cases of scurvy. Hooker also ordered his men to bathe twice a week, keep their uniforms and rifles clean, and change their underwear at least once a week. Drills and inspections were reinstated, leading one soldier to write that conditions were very different from what it was a month ago. Desertions fell dramatically after Hooker instated a 10-day furlough rotation for homesick men, turning what was formerly called a mob into a place of, as one soldier wrote, cheerfulness, good order, and military discipline, making fighting Joe Hooker a commanding administrator during the darkest days of America's war with itself. The Battle of Chancellorsville. After the Union Army's defeat at the Battle of Fredericksburg, Union General Ambrose Burnside was replaced by General Joseph Hooker, who spent the spring of 1863 training his men for a planned assault on the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia. Instead, Hooker would face off with a Confederate force barely half his strength at what became known as the Battle of Chancellorsville. On April 27, 1863, Hooker placed two-thirds of his 115,000-man army in front of Fredericksburg, Virginia, in an effort to feign a frontal attack on the city, leading a third of his men across the Rappahannock River in an attempt to flank Lee's 60,000-man force from behind. In response, a quick-thinking Robert E. Lee divided his force as well, leaving 10,000 men under the command of Jubal Early to face off against Hooker's Fredericksburg line before marching the remainder of his men west to clash with the flanking Union Army in an open field just beyond the wilderness, which was a heavily forested area west of Chancellorsville, Virginia. When the two flanking armies came together on May the 1st, a bewildered Hooker commanded his men to fall back into defensive positions, prompting Lee to devise one of the most brilliant maneuvers of his storied military career. Lee split his men yet again, sending Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson to attack the Union's right flank, which quickly overwhelmed the Union line. The following day, Jackson marched his 28,000-man army 15 miles to attack Hooker's exposed flank leading to an overwhelming victory for the Confederate cause. At sunset, after his second day of victory, Jackson led his men into a forest where a Confederate regiment led by General Jeb Stuart mistook Jackson's men for the enemy. In the exchange of gunfire that followed, Jackson was struck by a bullet that shattered his left shoulder, and after his arm was amputated in a field hospital, he died of pneumonia on May the 10th, 1863. On May the 3rd, a badly beaten General Hooker came under attack once again, when General Lee ambushed Hooker's 27,000-man troop buildup he had left behind to attack Fredericksburg. And over the next several days, Hooker and his rain-soaked, beaten men retreated back to Washington, D.C. By the end of the fighting, the Union Army had sustained 17,278 casualties, including 7,500 deaths, while the Confederates saw 12,826 casualties, including 3,500 deaths, prompting President Abraham Lincoln to proclaim, my God, my God, what will the country say? The Siege of Vicksburg. Part of the second strategy in the North's Anaconda Plan, first proposed by Union General Winfield Scott, Union Major General Ulysses S. Grant's 70,000-man Army of the Tennessee began an assault on Confederate fortifications at Vicksburg 
which was the last major Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River, preceded by a naval assault on the River City by Union Admiral David Porter. Grant marched his army along the west bank of the Mississippi, well past Vicksburg, crossing near Jackson in an amphibious campaign not to be equaled until the Second World War. After defeating a Confederate force at Jackson, Grant turned back toward Vicksburg, where on May 16th he defeated a Confederate force at Champion Hill, led by General John C. Pemberton, before being repulsed at Vicksburg on May 19th and yet again on May 22nd. Finding Pemberton's 30,000-plus man army well entrenched in the hills surrounding Vicksburg, Grant prepared for a long siege by constructing 15 miles of trenches, which effectively trapped Pemberton's forces inside its perimeter. Confederate attempts to rescue Pemberton's army failed from both the east and the west, and as conditions and supplies inside the city began to deteriorate, Many residents moved into more than 500 man-made tunnels and caves to escape the North's near-constant bombardment, prompting Union soldiers to nickname the town Prairie Dog Village. After holding out for 40 days, on July the 4th, 1863, 29,495 Confederate soldiers surrendered to Grant, giving the North full control of the Mississippi River while effectively excising Arkansas, Texas, and parts of Louisiana from the Confederacy for the remainder of the war. Combined with Confederate General Robert E. Lee's defeat at Gettysburg the previous day, the back-to-back -back Union victories would prove to be a critical turning point in the Civil War, prompting President Abraham Lincoln to write that the Mississippi River again goes unvexed to the sea. As for the besieged town of Vicksburg, her people would forgo Fourth of July celebrations for the next 81 years to come. America's first opioid crisis. Before the American Civil War, opium pills and laudanum, a mix of opium and alcohol, were sold without a prescription in drugstores across the nation. But as battle injuries mounted in the early days of the war, opioid pills became one of the most essential tools in a doctor's medical bag on both sides of the conflict, leading one Confederate medical handbook to advise that opium is the one indispensable drug on the battlefield, important to the surgeon as gunpowder to the ordnance. Doctors and nurses used opium and morphine, mainly to treat pain, but also to stop internal bleeding, as well as for the control of vomiting and diarrhea caused by infectious diseases, leading to a tidal wave of addicted soldiers and veterans, both during and after the war. While many Civil War veterans found opioid addiction to be a life-ruining and possibly fatal condition, when medical personnel began using the relatively new invention of the hypodermic syringe to inject morphine and other liquid opioids directly into the veins of wounded soldiers. While pain relief was nearly instantaneous, the practice proved to be far more addicting. Black soldiers, on the other hand, rarely suffered from opioid addiction, primarily due to the racial disparities in medical care provided to black soldiers compared to white soldiers leading white-addicted soldiers, quite without irony, to name the condition opium slavery. When veterans returned home after the war, ready access to opioids ballooned addiction rates in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, even among a growing legion of the non-veteran population, while Civil War physicians' heavy use of the hypodermic syringe helped mainstream the use of syringes and liquid opium throughout the United States. Morphine, heroin, and syringe sales became so readily available that average Americans could buy each product from the Sears and Roebuck catalog, leading to the nation's first full-fledged opioid addiction crisis by the late 1880s, affecting one out of every 200 Americans by the turn of the century. By the late 19th century, medical textbooks and instructors 
began to warn against the overuse of opioids by physicians. While most states outlawed opium-based products by 1915, making America's first opioid crisis a prescient foreshadowing of today's mounting wave of overdose deaths. Mosby's Rangers. Initially, John Singleton Mosby was opposed to the South's succession from the United States, but a sense of Southern homeland persuaded him to enlist in the Confederate Army as a private serving under William Grumble Jones. After serving with the Washington Mounted Rifles and later the Virginia Volunteers, General Jeb Stewart took notice of Mosby's aptitude for intelligence gathering. He promoted Mosby to first lieutenant and assigned him to the General's Cavalry Scouts. And in June of 1863, under the authority of General Robert E. Lee, and the Partisan Ranger Act as enacted by the Confederate Congress, John Mosby formed and took command of the 43rd Battalion. Mosby's sole tactic involved executing small raiding parties of up to 150 men behind Union lines, relying heavily on stealth to enter target areas undetected, executing attacks on Union positions before scattering into the surrounding woods and dispersing the troops among local Southern sympathizers, literally and figuratively melting into the countryside. Mosby's attack and hide strategy operated mainly within the distance a horse could travel in a day's hard ride, which generally amounted to raids within a 25 mile radius of Middleburg, Virginia, although some raids went into Maryland after the battalion expanded to six cavalry companies and one artillery company by the summer of 1864. Mosby believed and repeatedly proved that, in his own words, a small force moving with celerity and threatening many points on a line can neutralize a hundred times its own number. The Rangers' fast attack hit and run tactics were largely carried out with two pistols for each raider, since carbines proved to be unsuited for fighting on horseback. Speed, surprise, and shock represented the true secret weapon of Mosby's command, allowing a small, intrepid force to charge much larger lines of Union soldiers, representing one of the first unified displays of guerrilla warfare tactics in American military history. During the battalion's existence, Mosby's Rangers conducted a total of 33 major offensives, making the 43rd Battalion one of the most storied units in Civil War history. The Battle of Gettysburg. After the Confederates' first offensive into the North ended in defeat at Antietam the previous fall, by late June of 1863, Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia yet again set out on a second round offensive into the North. In response, Major General George Gordon Meade ordered the immediate pursuit of Lee's 75,000-man army, prompting three days of bloody combat at the prosperous crossroads town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. After Confederate troops were pushed back through town to Cemetery Hill by Union Cavalry Brigades on July the 1st, Lee gave discretionary orders to counterattack before reinforcements could arrive on the Union side. Confederate General Richard S. Ewell hesitated due to his assessment of Union strength in the field, allowing Union Corps General Winfield Scott Hancock to arrive with reinforcements, setting up a defensive line that ran from Cemetery Ridge to a second hill known as Little Round Top. Against the advice of his subordinate generals, on July 2nd, Lee ordered a flanking attack on Union positions, setting off a 4 p.m. battle that would lead to approximately 9,000 casualties on either side, bringing the two-day casualty total to some 35,000 men. The Union Army held their ground, which dragged the conflict into a third day of punishing warfare. After sunrise on July the 3rd, 
Union forces engaged in a seven-hour firefight at Culp's Hill, pushing back the Confederate threat until Lee ordered a 15,000-man offensive under the command of General George Pickett. Known as Pickett's Charge, at around 3 p.m., Pickett tasked his men into marching some three-quarters of a mile across open fields against dug-in Union positions, leaving his men exposed on all sides to withering artillery and small arms fire, leading to a 50% casualty rate on the Confederate side, while Pickett's division in particular lost two-thirds of its men. Although the overly cautious Meade met criticism for not pursuing the Confederate Army during their humiliating withdrawal, combined with Ulysses S. Grant's July 4th victory at Vicksburg, the two battles irrevocably turned the momentum of the Civil War firmly in favor of the Union side. By the end of the three-day battle at Gettysburg, Union casualties stood at 23,000 men, while the Confederates lost some 28,000, leading to President Abraham Lincoln's now infamous Gettysburg Address on November 19, 1863. The Battle of Chickamauga. In a bid to control the vital railhead city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, by mid-September 1863, Union General William Rosecrans managed to push General Braxton Bragg's Army of the Tennessee some 12 miles southwest of the city. In a moment of low-point morale within the Confederate Army, on news that General James Longstreet's men were on the march to shore up Bragg's forces, with some 65,000 men at his command, Bragg felt confident that his numerical advantage over Union forces would win the day and retake the key railheads of Chattanooga. On the morning of September 19th, the two armies converged on one another in a forest lining the banks of Chickamauga Creek where Bragg ordered repeated attacks on the Union's left flank, led by Union General George Thomas, a West Point graduate and Virginia native who remained loyal to the Union cause despite his Confederate birthright. After a day of egregious losses on both sides, when Longstreet finally arrived with two more brigades, Bragg chose to split his army into two fighting wings, Longstreet commanding the left, while General Leonidas Polk led the right. Advancing at 11.30 the next day, by pure chance, Longstreet's men caught Rosecrans in a reflanking maneuver, allowing rebel forces to punch through a weakened gap in the Union line, in turn forcing a chaotic retreat toward Chattanooga by Federal troops. Despite his depleted numbers, Thomas and a contingent of steadfast men held the field until nightfall earning the nickname The Rock of Chickamauga for his committed resolve. The following morning, after Thomas and his men retreated for Chattanooga under the cover of darkness, Confederate Generals Longstreet and Nathan Bedford Forrest pleaded with Bragg to pursue the defeated Union Army, yet Bragg failed to act due to his loss of 10 Confederate generals and some 20,000 rebel soldiers against Union casualties of nearly 16,000 making the Battle of Chickamauga the costliest two-day engagement in the Civil War's Western theater. Bragg's inaction allowed Union forces to retake the safety of Chattanooga, leading to the Confederates' reversal of fortune during the November Battle of Chattanooga, making the Battle of Chickamauga the second most deadly engagement of the American Civil War. Today in the Daily Dose, the Gettysburg Address. On July 4th, 1863, Confederate General Robert E. Lee retreated into Virginia after the Battle of Gettysburg saw more than 37% of his 75,000-man army killed, missing, or injured. A month later, Lee would hand his resignation to Confederate President Jefferson Davis who promptly refused to accept the general's defeated stand-down. And while President Abraham Lincoln expressed his frustration that Union General George Meade failed to pursue Lee's forces in retreat, 
he accepted an invitation to speak at the dedication of a national cemetery at Gettysburg. On the morning of November 19th, after former Secretary of State, U.S. Senator, and Harvard College President Edward Everett delivered a two-hour dedication address, Lincoln took to the podium to deliver a two-minute speech that would later become known as the Gettysburg Address. Before a gathered crowd of some 15,000 people, in less than 275 words, Lincoln expressed his conviction that the Civil War was the greatest test to the survival of the United States as created by the Declaration of Independence, noting quite eloquently that the Union dead who laid down their lives at Gettysburg had done so to ensure that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. But in a larger sense, Lincoln went on to say, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. While many of Lincoln's essential themes in the Gettysburg Address were not new to his rhetoric or thinking, the most radical aspect of his speech was his assertion that the Declaration of Independence highlighted the Founding Fathers' intentions more than the U.S. Constitution, since the later doctrine did not prohibit slavery, while the Declaration of Independence clearly expressed a dedication to the proposition that all men are created equal. Sometime after Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Edward Everett would write the President, I wish I could flatter myself that I had come as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes, making the Gettysburg Address one of the most impactful speeches in the annals of American history. And there you have it, the Gettysburg Address, today in the Daily Dose. If you want early access to Daily Dose documentaries before they're made publicly available, consider supporting us on Patreon so that you too could feed the filmmakers who feed your brains.